Hi, I'm Professor Ellie Anderson, and I am, sorry, that high was very high pitched. One has to worry about these things as a young woman professor on YouTube. In any case, <laughs> I'm from California, so whatever, we'll go with it. Um, hi, I'm Professor Ellie Anderson, and today I am going to um, just present for you all a conference paper that I gave in 2020 for a conference on phenomenology. And um, the conference paper here has since been developed into an article um, that is called My Heart is Yours, A Phenomenology of Self-Reflection. Sorry. My Heart is Yours, A Phenomenology of Self-Revelation Through Affective Consciousness in a Springer volume that is edited by Anthony Steinbach. If you want to read that, you can check out my academia page, um, but I just wanted to go ahead and present the conference version of it, which is a bit shorter and a little bit more... Uh, readable or like, yeah, <laughs> it's meant for, for an audience to be, it's meant to be listened to. Let's say that here. Um, that said, this audience is definitely an academic audience. This is part of a small workshop on phenomenology that was uh, all professors who work in this field. So uh, it's definitely kind of pitched to a different audience than my continental thought lectures or the overthink podcast that I host. So if you prefer something that's a little bit more introductory, I'd recommend checking out that stuff. If you're interested in phenomenology, though, and affective consciousness and love, then buckle up. Okay. <laughs> Introduction. It's commonplace to say that love shows us sides of ourselves we didn't know were there. In addition to orienting us toward the loved one, love also gives us to ourselves in unique ways. At its most joyful, love promotes positive feelings of self-worth. One way that it does this is by reflecting back images of ourselves as attractive, exciting, and beloved. We see ourselves as if through the eyes of the loved one. Yet such second sight can also be painful. The loved one faces us with our own psychological patterns and damaging idiosyncrasies. We at times feel ugly and unworthy in their eyes. Whether the source of self-affirmation or self-deprecation, such self-images are always illusions. Try as we might, we can never truly see ourselves through the eyes of another, no matter how well we know that person or how much we love them. When we focus too much on our self-image as mediated through the other, we reduce love to a narcissistic moment of projection in the return to self. Nonetheless, the attempt to see ourselves through the eyes of the loved one is an important feature of love. Compliments, intimate conversations, and shared experiences do shift our self-image in significant ways. Moreover, these shifts speak to a more general component of our relations with others. Others experience me as objects of their own consciousness. In turn, I'm faced with my own objecthood in the face of another. The other sees me as I cannot see myself, and I am affected by this encounter because it makes me feel like an object. Feeling like an object need not have a negative connotation, however. On the contrary, it re reveals the self in as much as a part of what it is to be a self is to be an object for other persons. As such, feeling one's own objecthood is a key feature of self-revelation. This is a theme throughout a lot of my work. I've written an article with Caleb Ward on how this emerges in sexual contexts. I've written about it in um, uh, material research on Sartre's concept of the look, which I also have a video about um, and in other places. In this presentation, I argue that self-revelation involves a complex dynamic of feeling oneself as both subject and object. Notice that I've been describing this in terms of feeling rather than knowing or perceiving. This is because affective consciousness is the mode in which this dynamic is evident. In section one, I discuss affective consciousness in the phenomenological tradition focusing especially on Jean-Paul Sartre. I explain how Sartre's theory of the look lays out the basic dynamic of self-revelation as the oscillation between feeling like a subject and feeling like an object. I address how Sartre's view is deepened in the work of Jean-Luc Nancy and Jacques Derrida, who take up phenomenological insights in their analyses of auto-affection. I suggest that these insights illuminate the dynamic of self-revelation in the face of the other. In section two, I apply this general dynamic of self-revelation to a specific form of affective consciousness, loving. I show that loving another person both puts me outside of myself and individuates me. In loving, I try to see myself as the other sees me. And while this is impossible, it is revelatory of the self all the same. 
I end by using Anthony Steinbach's analyses of moral emotions to claim that love can be seen as a moral emotion in all three senses in which Steinbach uses the term. Section one, affect of consciousness and the feeling of being an object. In this section, I lay out the basic contours of affect of consciousness as they pertain to self-revelation. My guiding hypothesis is that self-revelation involves a felt sense of one's human condition as both subject and object. This conception of the human condition is most evident in existentialism, but may also broadly be seen in phenomenology. Phenomenology rejects the idea that the self is a thing or entity. Instead, the self is a dynamically unfolding process that is linked with the first person perspective. And yet phenomenology also asserts that I am always already in relation to others and that these others experience me as an object. Quick caveat here. To say that others experience me as an object is not to say that they dehumanize or treat me badly, but rather simply to say that their consciousness is intentionally directed toward me as an object. All right. Well, it's not the case that all phenomenologists make as clear a distinction between the self as subject and self as object as I do here. I do think that this distinction is broadly traceable in phenomenology. For the purposes of clarity, however, I will take Jean-Paul Sartre's theory of the look as my starting point. This is perhaps the boldest articulation within the phenomenological tradition of the impasse between the self as subject and self as object. And as I argue elsewhere, the look is a paradigmatic example of affective consciousness. I have an article, um, oh gosh, what's it called? Shame of self or something like that. It's Sartre and affective consciousness. You can find it on my academia page. Um, Before discussing the look, then let us say something about how phenomenologists understand affective consciousness. Both classical and existential phenomenology distinguish affects from cognition or knowledge. Affects and cognition are distinct modes of consciousness, though both are intentionally geared towards an object. Cognition involves a strong separation between the knower and the known. Sartre identifies cognition with a subject-object dualism, where the subject or knower is invisible to itself in the experience of knowing. He talks about this in Being a Nothingness. All that is present to the knower is the known object out there beyond itself. And this known object appears as a fullness of being unto itself, completely separate from the knower. Affective consciousness, by contrast, does not involve a sharp dualism between subject and object. The affecting and the affected can be the same. So what is affect? Generally speaking, phenomenologists lack the distinction between emotion and affect that has become common today with the rise of affect theory in academic scholarship. Sartre, for instance, generally uses the adjective affective in tandem with the noun feeling or sentiment in French. Affective consciousness is simply feeling and it is disclosed in particular emotions. Sartre attributes the distinction between cognition and affect to Husserl, the founder of phenomenology. He admires Husserl for highlighting the idea that consciousness has other modes besides cognition, whereas much of the philosophical tradition tends to conflate the two and to miss affective consciousness completely. No surprise that philosophers have tended to emphasize thinking or cognition over feeling. One thing to note here is that, as we stated above, affective consciousness does involve a subject-object dualism. This is what Heidegger, Derrida, and others will call auto-affection. Husserl and Merleau-Ponty use the example of a person's hands touching each other. Here, each hand is both touching and touched. Yet there's still a relevant distinction between the subject and object, or affected and affecting. In the case of self-revelation, as we'll explore below, my feeling of being a subject is very different from my feeling of being an object. However, this difference is not a dualism. Rather, it is what Nancy Bauer calls, and I absolutely love this phrase. Thank you, Nancy Bauer, for coining this. Um, She's a contemporary uh, scholar of Simone de Beauvoir and feminist theory. It's what Nancy Bauer calls a, quote, phenomenological dilemma. I am both subject and object at the same time. I can feel this, but I cannot make sense of it through cognition. And it's not, it doesn't map onto an ontology. It's not an ontology of dualism. It's a phenomenological dilemma. My hands are both touching and touched, but they feel different as touched and as touching. Sartre in particular highlights how crucial affective consciousness is for giving me proof of the existence of others. And by extension, for giving me a sense of myself as an object. Affective consciousness attests to the fact that I always already find myself bound up in the world with others. To state it simply, for Sartre, I need no further proof of the existence of others than my feeling of being an object for them. In being a nothingness, 
Sartre famously describes how this feeling of being an object comes about through the look. When the other turns to look at me, I encounter the other as subject. I feel myself slip away from myself because an other is experiencing me here at this very spot where I stand. The gaze of the other fixes me into an object, leaving me vulnerable to them. It's through the other's look that I first receive my objecthood. Sartre says, quote, for me, the other is first the being for whom I am an object, end quote. I also have a video about this in my Continental Thought Lectures. If you want to take a look at it, it's just a short introduction to Sartre's theory of the look. If you want to take a look, I said, <laughs> all right. The look of the other gives me to myself as an object. And this would be misleading if I were not in fact an object, right? But I am. That is, I am an object for others. So experiencing myself as an object is a crucial dimension of my self-revelation. I couldn't experience this facet of my selfhood on my own. I'm dependent on the other for it. Without the encounter with the other, I experience myself only as a subject. I have an intimate first-person perspective and an acquaintance with my own freedom. In giving me to myself as an object, the other's presence inaugurates a dynamic interaction between my subjectivity and my objecthood. And this dynamic interaction is the self. Thus, there can be no self if there is no look of the other, because a crucial feature of the dynamic of being a self is being an object. And this can only come about through the look of the other. So Sartre's account has been criticized on a number of fronts, but I contend here that it's a useful framework for the dynamic of self-revelation that we find in other phenomenologists. Before explaining why, let me briefly say that I generally agree with the most common criticism of Sartre's look, which is its emphasis on vision. Feminist theorists and philosophers of the body have pointed out that Sartre's choice of vision as the exemplar of the relation to others is infelicitous. Focusing on the look overstates the separation between self and other and may imply a false originary independence from others. But that said, I think Sartre's basic framework is applicable to other senses, including that of touch, as we will see in discussing auto-affection below. One of the reasons that Sartre's account of the look is so interesting here is that Sartre, Sartre, expi Sartre describes it. I'm really, really gearing up. I was so excited to tell you this, sort of that sentence. One of the reasons that Sartre's account of the look is so interesting here is that Sartre explicitly describes it in terms of affect. The look inspires feelings such as shame or pride. While Sartre's account of shame in the chapter on the look has received much attention, the fact that this links up with a broader theory of affective consciousness has generally been overlooked. The look has wrongly been interpreted as a cognitive account of the relation to others, despite the fact that Sartre explicitly frames it in terms of affective consciousness as opposed to cognition. So I developed that point more in the article that I mentioned a bit ago, which is in Philosophy Today. The, the journal philosophy today. The look of the other is experienced on an affective level in as much as it affects my very being. Sartre claims that his emphasis on affective consciousness is what makes his view of self-other relations an improvement on the theories of other philosophers, especially Hegel. In my view, the reason for this is that affective consciousness rather than cognition is the mode of self-revelation. The look of the other gives me to myself as an object affectively. I do not know myself as the other sees me, but I feel my own objecthood in the face of the other. And from the perspective of cognition, I cannot make sense of the fact that I can be a subject and an object at the same time, but I can directly feel this duality. And this feeling is crucial for self-revelation, this duality without dualism that we described earlier as a phenomenological dilemma. One way that we respond to this feeling of being an object is by attempting to see ourselves as others see us. It's threatening to feel that I'm an object for an other who is judging me in ways I cannot grasp. <laughs> Try uploading a YouTube video sometime and you'll really see this in action. <laughs> and so I seek to reduce that threat by affirming my objecthood and seeing myself as an object through what Sartre calls reflection. In reflection, I divide myself into the reflecting and the reflected on. I see myself as if in a mirror. So all right, I try to get around and see how you are seeing me. But for Sartre, the project of self-reflection necessarily fails. We're incapable of recognizing ourselves because we can't see ourselves from the outside. The other, however, is able to recognize us. And so my being as object, quote, will be realized only in existence for others, end quote. And this means that the look of the other expropriates me. I suddenly feel the fact that I am vulnerable to others by virtue of appearing to them in a way I cannot appear to myself. 
I am not the locus of my judgments about myself. The other has an access to me that I do not have. I am as the other sees me, but I cannot see myself as the other does. Drawing attention to the affective nature of the look reveals a compelling through line from Sartre back to early phenomenology with Husserl and Stein's inquiries into empathy and Shaler's conception of the order of the heart. Sartre is in line with Shaler's view that the emotions present a distinct structure of evidence. We see here that they are evidence of the existence of the other and by extension of myself. It also reveals that Sartre is closer than is ordinarily thought to his contemporaries Beauvoir and Merleau-Ponty, who more clearly emphasize the affective character of touch. So too does Sartre provide a strikingly similar portrayal to that of later French thinkers in the phenomenological tradition, such as Nancy and Derrida. For the purposes of space, here I will only discuss the latter, the relevant connections to Nancy and Derrida. Their accounts of autoaffection and love specifically highlight the dynamic play of self-revelation that I want to address here. In their work on autoaffection and the heart, Derrida and Nancy highlight the themes of expropriation and difference. Like Sartre, they emphasize how the relation to the other cannot be captured by reason or cognition. The experience of the other in touch is fundamentally affective. In Nancy and Derrida's language, it is a matter of the heart. Derrida and Nancy play up the impasse that Sartre describes between one's subjectivity and objecthood by destabilizing the very notion of subjectivity. Subjectivity is irreducibly affected by alterity. Similarly to Sartre's account of the look, Nancy describes how we are exposed to others. Exposition, Nancy writes, quote, is a condition of that whose essence or destination consists in being presented, given over, offered to the outside, to others, even to the self, end quote. That's from his essay, Shattered Love. To be exposed is to be outside of one's subjectivity in a domain where no closed circle of a return to self is possible. Exposition occurs in what Nancy calls the regime of the heart. And he contrasts exposition with dialectic. He associates dialectic with the subject as opposed to the heart. In exposition, we are given over to others and to ourselves. No dialectical appropriation is possible. So this is structurally similar, in my view, to Sartre's claims about the affective consciousness of being an object, where I'm an object, but I can't see myself as such from the outside. Such a similarity is all the more evident in Derrida's theory of auto-affection, where auto-affection is always auto-hetero-affection. For Derrida, to touch oneself is to be touched by the other. Derrida states, quote, even self-touching touches upon the heart of the other, end quote. Auto-affection is both the condition for the possibility of the self and the condition for the possibility and the condition for the impossibility of the self as pure. It's cut off from the other. That is a classic characterization of deconstruction, right? Is that something is the condition for the possibility of something else, but it's at the same time the, imposs the condition for the impossibility of that thing as pure. Um, I'd recommend the work of David Wells and Jeffrey Bennington if you're interested in learning more about how deconstruction works here. I also have a short video on Derrida in the Continental Thought Lectures playlist. All right, a uh, quote from Derrida from Voice and Phenomenon. Autoaffection is not a modality of experience that characterizes a being that would already be itself, autos. Autoaffection produces the same as the self-relation in the difference with itself, the same as the non-identical, end quote. Autoaffection both produces and interrupts the self. As described, autoaffection is one name for the dynamic of subjectivity and objecthood that Sartre articulates. So Sartre doesn't use that term autoaffection, but I think it's really useful to connect to his view of the dynamic of subjectivity and objecthood. And one component of it that Derrida usefully highlights is the fact that autoaffection attests to the impossibility of self-presence. If autoaffection is requisite for selfhood, it is also irreducibly dependent on heteroaffection. Oh, but, but is, restarting that sentence. If autoaffection is requisite for selfhood, but is also irreducibly dependent on heteroaffection, then I am always in a sense outside myself. As in Sartre's look, I am the object of unknown experiences and value judgments that come from the other. I'm exposed to go back to Nancy's term for the regime of the heart. Now, for his part, Derrida emphasizes that this encounter must be tactile rather than visual, 
Focusing on seeing the other, he contends, implies a level of specular reflection that does not adequately claim or capture the claim that the other places on me. And that's from his book, On Touching, the, the book that's called On Touching Jean-Luc Nancy and is like 500 pages or something. Touch interrupts a specular dimension of the visual and with it interrupts the notion of a self-possessed subject. This is why Derrida associates autoaffection with autoeroticism in his early work, which I've also written about. And in his late work, follows Nancy in associating autoaffection with the heart. Nancy too emphasizes the importance of autoaffection here. In his book, Corpus, Nancy describes self-touching as a way of becoming oneself without returning to itself. I feel like I ended up just mostly talking about Derrida here. I think in the article version, I developed the Nancy material in greater detail. To briefly summarize this section, I've discussed how the encounter with the other brings about a new feeling of my being, namely the feeling of being an object. Affective consciousness is a distinct mode of consciousness, and my experience of the other is disclosed, is disclosed to me through it. Yet my experience of myself is also disclosed to me affectively inasmuch as the feeling of being an object comes into contact with my subjectivity and inaugurates the dynamic of selfhood. This dynamic is auto-effective and inextricably bound up with my relations with others. I can never have a closed circle of a return to self here, but I'm always in a sense outside myself. All right, now I'm gonna bring this to uh, the example of love. And this is section two, love as self-revelation. Here, I'll argue that loving relationships with other persons are where this feeling of being both an object and a subject are disclosed in an especially salient fashion. Let me first discuss the nature of loving. Loving, as understood in the phenomenological tradition, is a mode of affect of consciousness. It is a feeling that apprehends the value of a loved one. But to say that love is a feeling is not to say here that it is a sheer fleeting whim with respect to which we are passive. It's not an irrational or amoral impulse, nor is it separate from the realms of, of ethics or evidence. Instead, love is what Steinbach describes as a moral emotion. So I follow Steinbach, who's a phenomenologist, follow his contention that, quote, some emotions are directly moral and further that moral judgments have an evidential dimension and are not merely supports for judgments, end quote. Love is one of these emotions. And if you want more from Steinbach here, um, I'd recommend the volume that this article is published in, as well as, um, his book, Moral Emotions, actually a number of his books address this. So maybe Moral Emotions is a good place to start, but you could check out other ones as well. As Steinbach notes, phenomenology requires rejecting the idea that only reason and or sensibility are admissible sources of evidence. Affect of consciousness as distinct from cognition and perception is a unique source of evidence. In addition, for phenomenologists, feelings are acts. Specifically, feelings are intentional acts of consciousness directed toward an object. In the case of love, consciousness is directed toward the loved one as a bearer of value. Love apprehends and affirms the value of the loved one. The fullest expression of this dynamic occurs within ongoing loving relationships. Here, love unfolds temporally and within an embodied situation that is reciprocal and shared between lovers. Loving another person institutes an intense process of self-revelation that may at once be experienced in momentary feelings and in ongoing developments with varying levels of depth. So I have thoughts on how unrequited love, as well as love that continues after a relationship ends pertains here, but I'm focusing specifically on this in this presentation and in the article on reciprocal loving relationships. Recall that the encounter with the other gives the other an access to me that I do not have to myself. My inability to experience the other's experience of me makes me feel like an object, but this is revelatory of myself. Given that loving is an encounter with the other, it shares this structure. Indeed, loving is an especially salient form of self-revelation. As Nancy describes it, love does not mean a loss of self. Rather, in loving, the self takes joy in its own presence, in the presence of the other. This means being bedazzled by oneself, love this, this phrase for it, yet not in a narcissistic fashion. One's awe of oneself is the awe of being oneself facing another or of experiencing oneself with another as beloved. Recall that Sartre describes reflection as one way that we respond to feeling like an object. In reflection, we try to see ourselves from the outside or as if from outside. Now we can apply this to loving. 
I will focus on one form of this dynamic, which is the emergence of self-images developed in relation to another person. These self-images always have something fictional about them because we can never see ourselves as the other sees us. Yet they're not mere projections. When the other person is communicative, these self-images can be specific and nuanced. Through compliments, conversations, and shared experiences, one can get the contours of how the loved one views oneself. When the other is not communicative, the lover's image of themselves may be vague, leaving us to fill in more blanks for ourselves. This sense of mystery can be highly erotic, but it also frequently produces dissatisfaction. So this is where my theory, my work on feminist theory links up with this material on phenomenology of love, because there's really good reason to believe that the lack of men's socialization around verbal expression causes distress to their partners. And if you're interested in learning more about that, my article, Hermeneutic Labor, um, which is uh, published in the feminist philosophy journal Hypatia, addresses this. You can find that on my academia page or maybe on fill papers, maybe in both. I don't know. Loving another person expropriates me. That is, loving casts me outside of my subjectivity. And it does so in two key interrelated aspects. First, the experience of loving makes me feel as if my center of gravity is outside myself because I'm attracted in the direction of the other. The loved one destabilizes my experience of the world and my own place within it. I feel outside of myself because my heart belongs to the other. I may be preoccupied or even obsessed. In his essay, Shattered Love, Nancy describes this as the, quote, love break, end quote. Love shatters my illusion of independence by revealing that I depend on the lover's love of me, though I cannot grasp this. He writes, quote, the love break simply means this, that I can no longer, whatever presence to myself I may maintain or that sustains me, propose myself to myself without something of me remaining outside of me, end quote. My love for another arrives as if from outside myself, and it remains in some sense outside of me. This is one explanation for both the anxiety and the joy associated with love. Passion for another person can bring about a sense of dis-ease, but can also make me feel expanded beyond my own personal reach. As Derrida writes in On Touching, quote, no one should ever be able to say my heart, my own heart except when he or she might say it to someone else and call him or her this way. And that is love, end quote. Beautiful passage, but now I'm also thinking about like people I know who call their partners my heart. And I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's a little cringe sometimes. In any case, second form of expropriation of self is that a loving relationship makes me feel loved. Feeling loved involves my sense of myself as an unknown object for the other. It is as if there is a crucial version of myself that another knows better than I do. This version of myself feels important to grasp. How does the one I love see me? What do they think of me? I might try to imagine myself as the loved one sees me, if only so that I can have a better understanding of the loved one whom I long to know inside and out. But as we've seen above, I'm unable to grasp myself through the eyes of the other. As Nolsi describes it, this feature of love brings about an ontological fissure within subjectivity. Love involves, Nancy writes, quote, a break in one's self-possession as subject. It is essentially an interruption of the process of relating oneself to oneself outside of oneself. From then on, I is constituted broken, end quote. This doesn't mean, however, that there's no point to our imagining ourselves as a loved one sees us. Rather, the creation of such self-images can be an illuminating form of self-revelation. So let's think about this in terms of an example. Um, I spent a while developing this example, so hopefully you like it. I think it made it into the article version of this too. Devin and Trey recently started dating and have been in a re loving relationship for a few months. Devin is a television writer and Trey is a nurse practitioner. They initially connected over the shared passion for travel and leftist politics. Their conversations about these topics were compelling to both not only because they respect each other's opinions on the topic, but also because they feel seen or recognized through their conversations about them. They're both affirmed in their images of themselves as people who enjoy travel and are politically engaged. They also value their differences. Devin values Trey's self-motivation and penchant for advanced planning. Trey appreciates Devin's go with the flow personality and concern for others. Both Devin and Trey appreciate being in a relationship with someone whose career and personality is starkly different from their own. 
In addition, they each value being appreciated as different by the other person. It makes them feel that they each have something to bring to the table as individuals. Now, this might sound shallow. Are, De- are Devin and Trace simply seeking in the other a narcissistic reflection of their own desirable self images? I would argue no. The affirmative feelings of self worth that each receives in the relationship go much deeper than this. As I argued above, the self images they have of themselves through the eyes of the other are not mere projections, but genuine self revelations. Now, let's imagine that Trey surprises Devin with a birthday trip to the desert. Devin is delighted by this, in part because it's a fun activity they can do together and because it reveals that Devin is important to Trey. But Devin is also delighted by the fact that the surprise trip reveals that Trey sees Devin as someone who will enjoy such a trip, that is, as an adventurous and outdoorsy person. Devin feels understood and appreciated in this mediated self-image. In addition, let's say that Trey has arranged for an evening of stargazing. Trey has rented a telescope so the lovers can look at the stars together under the desert sky. Trey isn't big on stargazing, but knows Devin had a passion for it in childhood and frequently stargazed on family trips. While Trey and Devin look at the stars together, Devin points out various constellations to Trey and tells Trey just how many millions of light years away the stars are. This information fills Trey with wonder. Their enjoyment of the activity is intimately shared, but it's pleasure for Devin is in part that it makes Devin feel recognized in a way that few others are able to see. Devin receives a a self-image mediated through Trey of a learned and passionate stargazer. Being able to share this experience makes Devin feel affirmed in a role that doesn't get much airtime in their relationship. Recall that this does not require that Devin be sure of how Trey sees Devin. Devin's self-images always have something fictional about them. The circuit of selfhood is never closed. Yet these self-images nonetheless are revelatory. So the example I've used focused on existing facets on um, Devin's self-image that are affirmed in Devin and Trey's relationship. But the dynamic of self-revelation here may also be found in relational settings where a brand new self-image is brought about. This can occur when a loved one sees strengths in us that encourage us to embark on new life paths that we previously did not consider possible. Now we can see that love does not only expropriate me, it also individuates me. The loved one offers a privileged refraction, a privileged refraction of the self as object, providing a key basis for selfhood. The self images described above are modes of auto affection. The tension between my attempted self understandings mediated through the other and my subjective experience of being riveted to myself produces individuation. This individuation is self-revelation. Following the analysis above, let me briefly say something specifically about revelation. Steinbach suggests that revelation is a distinct style of evidence found in loving. Revelation, Steinbach suggests, is different from other styles of evidence, which include presentation, manifestation, and disclosure. Love, as Steinbach describes it, quote, is the movement which allows the other to become more fully who he or she is, end quote. As such, loving does not simply reveal a pre-existing object. Rather, it orients itself toward the loved one in a direction of deepening or enhancement. Loving affirms the loved one in their process of becoming. And while Steinbach focuses on love, how love is revelatory of the loved one, I think we can say the same about the self. Loving is also the movement that affirms the self in its process of becoming. Hence, it is self-revelatory. And as such, I'd like to say a bit more about how I view love as a moral emotion in Steinbach's sense. In his book, Moral Emotions, Steinbach distinguishes three primary groups of moral emotions. First, some are moral emotions of self-givenness. These moral emotions often imply a self-assessment, but this need not be on the level of reflection. Moral emotions of self-givenness, such as shame or pride, quote, reveal the moral sense of the person in the dynamic process of becoming, end quote. Second are moral emotions of possibility, which, quote, express the transformation in relation to the way things have been or the way things are, a liberation from otherwise fixed predictable meanings and a liberation for something becoming otherwise, end quote. The third, type of moral, the third type of moral emotions are moral emotions of otherness. And these emotions, quote, are directly engaged with otherness in a way that is exemplary, end quote. 
While all moral emotions concern our relations to other persons, moral emotions of otherness do so in ways that essentially hinge on these relations. The interpersonal sphere is not the ground for these moral emotions, but their very content. Understandably, Steinbach categorizes love as a moral emotion of otherness. Love is a form of valuing another as given in his or her uniqueness, which involves accepting the other as they are and as they are unfolding. Steinbach describes love as a dynamic transcending that is oriented toward the irreducibly other person and their process of becoming. However, my argument sets us up to understand love additionally as a moral emotion of both other types. Using Steinbach's framework, I argue that love is also a moral emotion of self-givenness and a moral emotion of possibility. First, love may be considered an emotion of self-givenness. We've seen how the encounter with the other, whether conceived through look or touch, produces the feeling of being an object. This feeling is a mode of affect of consciousness and is evident in the experience of loving. As such, loving is a moral emotion of self-givenness. It inaugurates a relation between my pre-reflective subjectivity and my objectified self-images mediated through the loved one. It reveals how the dynamic between self as subject and self as ob object is not enclosed, but rather always an unfinished project in the face of the other. Loving individuates and expropriates me. It both reveals my self-givenness and brings about a new mode of self-givenness by giving me to myself as an object, an object that I can never grasp, but that is known by other, only by others. And second, love may be considered an emotion of possibility. Steinbach argues that moral emotions of possibility have, quote, a structure of liberation to free from something and to free for something and to realize personal freedom as a being bound to others, end quote. Recall Derrida and Nancy's contention that in loving, my heart is the heart of the other. In addition, loving relationships encourage us to become other than who we are today. At their best, they lead us toward personal enhancement. In my view, this has precisely the structure of liberation that Steinbach describes. Loving can free us from the hold our dominant self-images have over us. And it can free us for new realizations of ourselves. The self-image we receive in a relationship can be a crucial starting point for such new self-realizations. Here, we might think of the adage, adage? I think that's right. Adage? Adage. <laughs> Seeing is believing. To see myself as I imagine the other sees me might help me to realize my possibility of becoming that person. As such, the dynamic of expropriation and individu individuation that I argue is key to love may also be described as possibilization. To use a Sartrean turn of phrase, I am in the mode of being what I am not. I am my possibilities. All right, a brief conclusion paragraph. In claiming that the emotions have a distinct style of evidence, phenomenology illuminates the nature of self-relation. I have focused specifically on one form of self-relation here. The self-relation involved in experiencing oneself as both subject and object. I've shown how it is through the affect of encounter with the other that I experience myself as an object and that this encounter is crucial to my selfhood. Loving relationships in particular illuminate this dynamic, in part because they involve the attempt to see oneself through the eyes of the lover. This is a form of auto-affection, as Derrida and Nancy describe it, and also follows the dynamic that Sartre articulates in the look. The experience of self-revelation in love is not an experience of narcissistic appropriation. It does not succeed in giving me a grasp on myself as any kind of fixed entity. Rather, it is a self-givenness that is given to the other and that releases me for new possibilities. That's the end of this presentation. For more, read the published version of this in the 2022 Springer volumes on volume on um, phenomenology and contributions to the heart, edited by Anthony Steinbach. And check out my other work on academia. If you want something uh, a little bit more accessible, not geared towards an audience of fellow academics, as I mentioned, Overthink Podcast and our channel here.